Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. Coming up in the next hour. Election campaign gathers momentum in India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to kickstart BJP's UP poll campaign from Meerut. President Draupadi Murmu confers India's highest civilian award, Bharat Ratna, to former Deputy Prime Minister and veteran BJP leader LK Adwani at his residence in New Delhi. Turkey holds municipal elections across the country with all eyes on Istanbul. President Tayyip Erdogan seeks to reclaim control of Istanbul from rival Ekrem Imamoglu. America's major telecom company AT&T reports data leak of 73 million current former account holders on dark web. Well, let's get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic election. With the start of notification, campaigning for election to India's lower house of parliament has gathered momentum. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is launching BJP's election campaign in Uttar Pradesh today at a rally in Meerut. The BJP has fielded TV serial Ramayan fame Arun Govil from Meerut Lok Sabha constituency. Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath, Rashtriya Lok Dal President Jayant Chaudhary and several other BJP leaders will also be present at the rally. Uttar Pradesh will go to the polls in seven phases. The rally will serve as a precursor to a series of other events planned by BJP in coming weeks. On the other hand, Opposition India Bloc organized a mega rally at Ramlila Maidan in the national capital on Sunday. The rally was attended by leaders of India Alliance, including Congress leaders Malik Arjun Kharge, Sonia Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi Vadra. Kalpana Soren, wife of former Chief Minister of Jharkhand, Tejasvi Yadav of RJD, while Arvind Kejriwal's wife Sunita Kejriwal read out his message from the jail. Other leaders who attended the rally included veteran leader Sharat Pawar, AAP leader Atishi, TMC leader Derek O'Brien, Samajwadi party leader Akhilesh Yadav, National Conference leader Farooq Abdullah among others. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi addressed the rally. He said that the party is facing financial constraint as party's bank accounts have been seized. बैंक अकाउंट बंद कर दिए गए हैं चुनाव के बीच में देश की सबसे बड़ी ऑपोजिशन की पार्टी के सारे के सारे अकाउंट बंद कर दिए और राइट एंड दी डीना कॉर्पोरेंट दिव्यंदु मॉडल जॉइंस आस फ्रॉम न्यूज़ रूम फर्स्ट दिव्यंदु the India Bloc organizing a mega rally at Ramlila Maidan. Now, what is the actual motive behind the rally? Can you just tell us? Uh, well, Siddharth, that's right. You know, today the opposition alliance uh, ho held a massive rally uh, in Delhi's uh, Ramlila Maidan. It saw a myriad of opposition leaders from across the country who joined in uh, to, uh, to, to take on the government, incumbent BJP government mm. here in the national capital. But perhaps uh, what the opposition's rally was uh, motivated was against uh, the arrest of the uh, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal also uh, about you know, the opposition making, trying to make a point that their bank accounts have been frozen, that the government has been uh, using agencies to uh, corner the opposition parties in the country. Uh, they tried to use that forum to show perhaps a unity of the opposition alliances in the national capital. But having said this, Siddharth, uh, you know, uh, the opposition, even though they are trying to show some sort of unity in the national capital, when they go back to their own states, uh, they are quarreling amongst themselves is what 
uh, the opposition alliance are currently doing. Uh, remember in, in West Bengal, uh, the Trinamool Congress as well as the CPM and the Congress are uh, not in an alliance. Uh, so is the case with the Ahmadmi Party in Punjab. Even though the Ahmadmi Party as well as uh, the Congress shared the stage today at the opposition alliance meet, but in Punjab, uh, both the Congress and the Ahmadmi Party doesn't see eye to eye. Uh, so is the case with the Congress uh, when you go down south uh, in Kerala. Uh, the left and the Congress are fighting against each other uh, in the state of Kerala. So of course, uh, even though the opposition which tried to show uh, an alliance in, uh, in the national capital, uh, but when they go back to the states, uh, there seems to be that their, uh, that their alliances there are not working and the state units are not very happy with the fact that the, uh, that the national leaders of the Congress uh, are trying to stitch an alliance uh, in, in turn damaging them in, that, in those respective states. So of course, uh, even though the opposition uh, which, uh, which, uh, which brought in a large number of leaders including the Shiv Sena, the, the Samajwadi parties, Akhilesh Yadav, uh, the, the Trinamool Congress up on the stage as well as the Aam Admi Party's uh, Bhagwant Maan, this, uh, the mm. Chief Minister of uh, Punjab. Mm. Also, uh, we saw Heman Soren's wife, Kalpana Soren, uh, giving a speech at the, uh, at the Opposition Alliance rally at Ramlila Maidan. But, uh, you know, despite all being uh, shown to be hunky-dory, it seems uh, that the Opposition Alliance uh, at the respective states are uh, not very healthy. Yes, back to you. Well, definitely. I'll come back to you. I'll just come back to you, Dibendu. Just wanted to tell our viewers that we've been also joined by our correspondent Anbarsan, who's there in Chennai. Uh, Anbarsan, I'll come back to you when we talk about that region. But as of now, again, Dibendu, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is launching BJP's election campaign in Uttar Pradesh and BJP has fielded Arun Gobil, a renowned personality from Ramayan. Now, what impact would it create in the region and in the state having the highest number of Lok Sabha seats, Dibendu? Oh, well, of course, for every political party, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, Uttar Pradesh is a very crucial state. And as they say in politics, the road to Delhi goes via Uttar Pradesh. So, of course, uh, the Uttar Pradesh is a very important state for the BJP. Uh, it has 80 seats and the BJP is, uh, is expecting to win about 70 to 75 seats uh, from the state of Uttar Pradesh. And today's rally in Meerut, uh, which the Prime Minister is shortly going to address, is a mm. very crucial rally because uh, this, this is perhaps the Prime Minister's first electoral rally from the state of Uttar Pradesh mm -hmm. and he has chosen uh, Meerut uh, because uh, not just because you know the uh, the candidate that has been fielded by the BJP is 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 an actor turned politician now who is shot to fame as you rightly said uh, mm -hmm. through his popular uh, television series Ramayana where yeah. he played the Lord uh, the, the role of uh, Lord Ram. Yeah. So of course uh, that is something that the people of Meerut will connect to. Okay. Uh, what we are also being told uh, from people who are on the ground is that uh, the BJP's campaign in Meerut is, is picking up momentum ever since, uh, you know, Arun Govil had been declared candidate from there. But having said this, uh, Siddharth, you know, we have to understand the politics of the Western Uttar Pradesh, which is going to polls in the first two phases mm -hmm. of, uh, of the election. Uh, Western Uttar Pradesh is dominated by the uh, by the Jat community, and this time around, the BJP has been able to bring in uh, the tallest Jat leader, uh, Chaudhary Charan Singh's son, uh, into the RLD, which which uh, which is which represents the majority of the Jat community in Western Uttar Pradesh, mm -hmm. into the uh, into the NDA alliance. Of course, that the BJP is trying to ensure to gain maximum number of seats from this uh, from this region of uh, Uttar Pradesh and of course the BJP hopes that uh, by bringing in Jayan Chaudhary of the RLD into uh, the, the NDA alliance would perhaps uh, bring politically uh, positive results for the BJP. And of course uh, two important issues which uh, the Western Uttar Pradesh politics uh, revolves around is sugarcane mm. as well as the jarts. So okay. of course uh, these two important aspects will play around. And we All will right. also we All will right. also see the prime minister prime mm -hmm. minister talking about Chaudhary Charan Singh, uh, who had been recently been given the Bharat Ratna Award. Yeah. So of course, uh, this will also this will also uh, give electoral benefits to the BJP in in the region of Western Uttar Pradesh. Yes, back to well, you, definitely the Bindu, the election fervor is gripping the nation, and as I say in India. Election is just not a voting process, it's, it's not just an electoral process, it's a celebration. And the world is taking cues from India. Thank you so much, we'll leave it there. As the dates of India's general elections are near, political leaders across different spectrum have ramped up their election campaign. Tamil Nadu Chief Minister M.K. Stalin participated in election campaign in a road southern state of Tamil Nadu.
All right, and Didi India correspondent Anbarsan joins us from Chennai. Anbarsan, elections are just around the corner. How is uh, Tamil Nadu gearing up for the elections? Just 18 days more to the voting date of uh, April 19th, the first phase itself, uh, Tamil Nadu is going for the election. BJP, DMK and ADMK, all three alliances are brazen their uh, campaign across state. And today, BJP, the state B, uh, uh, BJP chief K. Nnamalai mm. has uh, raised the issue particularly regarding the Kachathivu. There is an island between uh, India and Sri Lanka, which is uh, 20 kilometers from the Indian shore. Uh, as Anamalai said that this Kachatiwe has been uh, ceded over to Sri Lanka in 1974 on uh, then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi uh, with the fact with uh, Sirma Rao Bandaranaika of uh, Sri Lankan President. So it significance that uh, Congress government with alliance with the DMK has continuously plays that uh, didn't uh, go with the Tamil sentiment and particularly seeding with uh, the Kachatiwe island which is very important for the fishermen of both uh, Sri Lanka and Tamil Nadu where the historically they have a connection there is a Anthoniar uh, there is a church whenever the fishermen need to take a rest that island would be very much All right. needed. Anbarsan tell us about the back, voting process there. Where okay. Anbarsan tell us about the voting process there. Yeah. The vote, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The voting process, uh, the campaign actually, the MK Stalin is uh, in E Road, the western district of Tamil Nadu, mm. where uh, he is campaigning. As he said that, uh, he is continuously accusing the central government regarding our uh, development schemes has been not been implemented and full swing, particularly the AIMS Madurai, which has been uh, uh, laid the foundation stone in uh, very long before. Until now, mm -hmm. the uh, hospital has been not uh, builded. And also, the AIDMK is continuously accusing using the D DMK government which is came after 2021 the nearly three year the anti anti incumbency is built yeah. that is what the ADMK uh, general secretary Adapadi K. Palnisami has said mm -hmm. and also the uh, BJP is right. continuously saying this DMK government particularly from the uh, top leaders they are saying the government All right. more on the corruption and also there is a mismanagement of various schemes particularly flood mismanagement and also drug related issues mm. so the youths are not getting uh, properly the drug related they mm. are addicted into that so these kind of issues are all three parties and uh, the alliances are racing. All right, election fever is certainly gripping the entire country. Thank you so much, uh, Anna Barsan. We leave it there. Asaduddin Oasi led AIMIM and Apna Dal will be contesting the upcoming India's Lok Sabha elections together. Both parties announced their alliance today with Asaduddin Oasi saying that he expects this to go beyond the Lok Sabha elections. <laughs> آپ سے ہوئی تھی تو ہم نے کہا کہ اس لڑائی کو ہم کو صرف پارلیمنٹ الیکشن تک ہی نہیں رکنا چاہیے بلکہ اس کو آگے لے کے جانا چاہیے تو ہم کو امید ہے کہ انشاءاللہ تعالیٰ یہ جو پی ڈی ایم بنا ہے ساماجیک نیائی کے بارے میں اس کو ہم اس کے ساتھ رہیں گے مائم پارٹی اور ہم لوگ اس کو آگے لے کر جائیں گے اور مجھے یقین ہے کہ اتر پردیش کی جنتہ اس پی ڈی ایم کا ساتھ دے گی well, on Sunday, BJP released one more name for the upcoming elections. The Central Election Committee of the Bharatiya Janata Party gave its approval to the name of Damodar Agarwal for the Bhilawara seat of Rajasthan in its ninth seat. All right, and still to come on DD Indian News R. Zelensky accuses Russia of carrying out wild strikes on Ukrainian energy. Turks vote in municipal elections focused on President Tayyip Erdogan's bid to reclaim control of Istanbul. Serbian President Alexander Vucic nominated his close ally Milos Vucevic to be the Prime Minister. We try to understand what are the opportunities and challenges that come with renewable energy? In terms of the radiation is better. When you compare to other districts in Gujarat, then we found a better uh, elevation for WTG's generation. Solar panels and wind turbines 
they kind of have a mind of their own. So you can increase generation to meet demand. You can also lower demand to kind of meet supply somewhere in the middle. It uses a renewable resource, the sun, to generate power. So it's quite good. We do have the option of plugging the cold room to the power grid. Typically, a balcony system consists of one or two solar modules. These modules contain crystals that convert sunlight into direct current, or DC. This inverter then turns the DC into AC, which is the type of electrical current used in households. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Chadhar Bharadwaj. As India prepares to hold the world's largest elections, here's a sneak peek in the country's political landscape, parties, and their strategies. As India prepares for general elections, it is important to understand the country's current political scenario. There are two main players in the fray. On the one side is the National Democratic Alliance led by incumbent Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party. Challenging the NDA is the India Alliance or Indian National Developmental Inclusive Alliance which was formed in 2023. While the NDA comprises nearly 40 mostly regional parties, the India Alliance has over 20 opposition parties including the Congress and Samajwadi Party. The 2024 polls will be a test of new coalitions. The formation of the India Alliance also marked the end of the Congress-led United Progressive Alliance. Let's take a look at how the existing and former alliances performed in the last general elections that were held in 2019. A total of 542 constituencies went to polls. The NDA won 353 seats, out of which 303 seats were backed by the BJP alone. The UPA won 91 seats, out of which the Congress backed 52, while 98 seats went to other parties and independent candidates. Coming back to the present time, in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, which has the highest number of parliamentary seats, the Congress and SP have struck a seat-sharing deal. Of the total 80 seats, the Congress will field its candidates in 17 constituencies while SP and other parties of the alliance will contest from 63 constituencies. However, the opposition India Alliance has been struggling to keep its flock together. The Trinamool Congress, which is the ruling party in West Bengal, has announced that it will be contesting the general elections alone. In another jolt to the India Alliance, Bihar State's incumbent Chief Minister, Janata Dal United Chief, Nitish Kumar returned to the NDA. In the 2024 polls, Prime Minister Modi will be aiming for a third consecutive term. The India Alliance, however, has not floated a PM candidate as yet. Apart from the battleground states, including UP, Bihar and Maharashtra, elections will also be closely watched in the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. This is the first general election after the abrogation of Article 370, which granted special status to the erstwhile state, JNK was also bifurcated into two union territories, Jammu and Kashmir and Adak. Coming to poll issues and promises, PM Modi has vowed to make India the world's third largest economy. Also, recently inaugurated Ram Temple is expected to feature prominently in the BJP's campaigns. In 2019, building the temple was among the party's key promises. As for the opposition, the Congress decided to organize a national nationwide march called Bharat Jodo Nyay Yatra or India Unity and Justice March to garner public support. From issues to campaigning, elections in India are multifaceted. But first and foremost, they are a celebration of democracy which sees voters from all walks of life choose their representatives. Bureau Report, DD India. 
Well, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched a scathing attack on Congress party on Sunday. PM Modi alleged that Congress gave away Kachathivu Island to Sri Lanka in 1974 during Indira Gandhi's regime after an RTI revealed the same. PM Modi quoted an article posted on social media platform X and I quote, New facts reveal how Congress callously gave away Kachathivu. This has angered every Indian and reaffirmed in people's minds, we can't ever trust Congress. Weakening India's unity, integrity and interests has been Congress's way of working for 75 years and counting. Last year on August 10, Prime Minister Narendra Modi targeted Congress over the decision to hand over Kachatibu Island to Sri Lanka. Responding to the no-confidence motion in the Parliament House on 10th of August 2023, the Congress party was accused of undermining the integrity and interests of the country. तमिल लाडु से आगे श्रीलंका के पहले एक तापु किसने किसी दूसरे देश को दे दिया था कब दिया था कहाँ गई थी क्या ये भारत माता नहीं थी वहाँ क्या वो माँ भारती का अंग नहीं था और इसको भी आपने तोड़ा और कौन था उस समय श्रीमती इंदिरा गांधी के नेतृत्व में हुआ था BJP's national president J.P. Nadda also spoke on the Kachathivu Island issue. In a post on X, he said, It's a part of Congress's work culture to give up Indian territory, given the slightest opportunity. BJP national spokesperson C.R. Kesavan strongly criticized the Congress, stating that the island surrender to Sri Lanka in 1974 without Parliament's consent has greatly endangered the livelihoods and lives of Tamil Nadu's fishermen. He asserted that the people of Tamil Nadu will not forgive Congress for this decision. Today, new shocking facts uh, have been uh, revealed, which clearly exposes the betrayal by the Congress of the Tamil people when people know how it surrendered the Kachatiwa Island in 1974. Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji has also tweeted today, uh, expressing his grave and serious concern about how the Congress government under Nehru and Indira Gandhi had undermined the sovereignty, interests and you know, unity of India in uh, surrendering this Kachatiwa. There was no consent of parliament. It was just done and given away to Sri Lanka. And one should remember, in 1974, the state government was run by the DMK, the central government was run by the Congress, and both of them were in alliance. This uh, expose today has really angered the people because they know this is the fountainhead, this is the root cause of the problem which we see today, which has placed in grave danger and risk, not just the livelihoods of a fisherman brothers, but also their lives on a day-to-day -day basis when they go out and seek their livelihood. The people of India and Tamil Nadu will never forget will never forgive this betrayal of the Congress party in surrendering Kachitivu and in the coming days, they will teach them a fitting lesson. India's President Draupadi Murmu conferred the Bharat Ratna, the country's highest civilian honour, on former Deputy Prime Minister Lal Krishna Advani at his residence in New Delhi. President Murmu paid a visit to senior BJP leader LK Advani's residence and conferred him with the prestigious award. The formal ceremony was attended by the Vice President Jagdeep Dhankar, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh, Home Minister Amit Shah and the family members of LK Advani. In 1970, LK Advani became a member of the Rajya Sabha and held the seat till 1989. He was elected President of the BJS and continued the helm until 1977. LK Advani served as the Home Minister and later as the Deputy Prime Minister in the Cabinet of uh, Atal Vihari Vajpayee between 1999 to 2004. 
News from Somalia now. Somalia parliament voted for historical amendments in its constitution that led to major changes. After the changes, now country's president has the authority to appoint and dismiss a prime minister from office. This change came due to major disputes revolving around the distribution of power between top two offices. The constitutional amendment has also paved the way for the presence of three political parties in the country, promoting multi-party system. The amended also sets the term of office for government constitutional bodies at five years. Independent Constitutional Review Commission submitted proposed amendments that establish the age of maturity for girls at 15 and the age of responsibility at 18. And Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic nominated his close ally Milos Vucevic to the, be the Prime Minister of, on Saturday to lead a new government through a time of war in Europe and tensions with Kosovo. The nomination comes more than three months after their party, the Serbian Progressive Party, won the most votes in national election on December 17. Vucevic took over leadership of the party after Vucic stepped down last year. Earlier, Vucevic was Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister in the government of his predecessor, Anna Brnabic. Vucevic is expected to form a government in the coming weeks. The ruling party has 113 seats in the 250-seat parliament and will have to seek partners to form a government. Voting in the Istanbul municipality elections commenced on Sunday in Turkey with a tense competition between President Tayyip Erdogan's AKP and the opposition party CHP. Polling stations opened at 7 a.m. in eastern Turkey and 8 a.m. elsewhere with over 61 million people registered to vote. Voting will conclude at 5 p.m. and initial results are anticipated by 10 p.m. And Vladimir Zelensky's term as Ukraine's president is set to expire in May this year. But the election, which was supposed to be held at the end of March, has been postponed because of the ongoing conflict. A correspondent, Megumi Lim, spoke to people in Kiev about their thoughts on Zelensky's extended presidency. Since its independence in 1991, Ukraine has held six presidential elections. But this year will be the first time it will be missing one. Martial law was declared in the country when Russia launched its full-scale invasion in 2022, and the law prohibits any form of elections. Now there are worries the war could hurt the country's democracy. So I think that unfortunately, we have challenges for democracy. We have eroding of democracy in Ukraine because some things are uh, started, the government started to like the situation when there are not questions in the way they were questioned before. Political opponents have criticized that parliamentary procedures are not being broadcast publicly like they used to be. And the current government-led news programming which broadcasts a united message on the war has drawn criticism that it drowns out diverse voices. But among these concerns, holding off elections were not at the top. Many Ukrainians believe that elections should not be held until the end of the war. According to a poll conducted by the Kiev Institute of Sociology last month, 69% supported Zelensky remaining in office for as long as martial law was in place. Last year, with the urging of U.S. officials, President Zelensky briefly entertained the idea of finding a way to carry out elections. But with the constant shelling of cities and millions of soldiers fighting on the front lines, security became an issue. Along with fairness, as people living under Russian occupation would not be able to take part. Many also warn a change in leadership now would be disruptive. Zelensky has already established contacts and agreements with representatives of other countries, so it will be probably very difficult for the new leader because he would have to do it all over again. We would just be wasting our time. Therefore, it would be logical to end the war and then hold elections. But experts say there could be more room for opposing voices incorporate into decision-making uh, some uh, his political opponent and uh, this would uh, legitimize uh, for his authority as well because uh, the, the society would see that uh, he, he is willing to, to hear the alternative voice and uh, uh, he is willing to accept criticism. Democracy is something Ukrainians have spent decades fighting for. 
But with Russia's invasion, the country's survival has now become their utmost priority. Megumi Lim in Kyiv reporting for DD India. Well, the head of Ukraine's largest private energy firm, DTEC, said five of its six plants had been destroyed on Saturday. 80% of plants generating capacity were lost after two weeks of Russian attacks. The repairs could take up to 18 months. DTEC executive director said the waves of attacks had hit thermal and hydro production in almost all regions in which distribution facilities were destroyed. He added that the company suffered losses amounting to $300 million. Russian missile and drone attacks hit thermal and hydro power plants in central and western Ukraine overnight on Friday. Russian terrorists are now targeting such vile strikes to cause the energy bleeding of Ukraine. We give all necessary signals to our partners, all the specific requests to everyone who has the necessary air defense systems, to everyone who has the necessary missiles. America, Europe and our other partners, everyone knows what we need. Everyone knows how important it is right now to help us protect ourselves from these blows at this very moment. Well, Indonesian firefighters battles to put out a massive fire that broke out at a military ammunition depot outside the capital, causing a series of explosions and sending flames and smoke into the night sky. No casualties reported. Military officials said that the fire started in a part of the facility that was used to store expired ammunition. All right, and still to come on DD Indian News Hour. Houthi run Sana based bank announced a choice of new currency in Yemen. Demolition crews begin work to cut portions of the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. Tel Aviv protesters call for immediate release of hostages from Hamas. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024, the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian Election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. A quick recap of the headlines. Election campaign gathers momentum in India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to kickstart BJP's UP poll campaign from Meerut. President Draupadi Murmu confers highest civilian award of India, Bharat Ratna, to former Deputy Prime Minister and veteran BJP leader LK Advani at his residence in New Delhi. Turkey holds municipal elections across the country with all eyes on Istanbul. President Tayyip Erdogan seeks to reclaim control of the Istanbul from rival Ekrem Imamoglu. Peruvian President Dina Boluarte's house gets raided as part of inquiries into possible illicit failure to declare ownership of luxury watches. Earlier, prosecutors began preliminary inquiries following a media report that the president possessed several Rolex watches. Boluarte has acknowledged that she owns Rolex watches, which she had bought with money since she was young. Peruvian President Dina Boluarte said she would not resign after her house was raided as part of inquiries into possible illicit enrichment and failure to declare ownership of luxury watches. I've always said I'm an honest woman. 
I took office with clean hands and thus I will retire from the presidency in 2026. I have attended the prosecutor's office by appointing my lawyers and making myself available so that the dawn measures are arbitrary, disproportionate and abusive. The situation is serious and affects my family's rights, but above all, the country's governance. Brothers and sisters, the president has been systematically attacked. Tropical cyclone Gamane killed at least 18 people and displaced thousands more in Madagascar. Although disaster teams have lifted cyclone alerts but warned the weather remains dangerous in Madagascar. The India correspondent Isabel Nakiria reports from Kampala, Uganda. Disaster teams have lifted cyclone alerts but warned the weather remains dangerous in Madagascar. Maritime users have been asked not to go out yet to see as risk assessments are being carried out. Emergency teams in Madagascar are still rescuing those trapped to safer ground in the north of the Indian Ocean Island nation. The National Disaster Risk Office warns that extreme climatic conditions could pose a risk to food security and livelihoods. Aid workers are planning to airdrop food beginning Saturday once the weather is favorable. Roads and bridges have been destroyed, making evacuations and food delivery difficult. The death toll is expected to rise as many are still missing. Many people are believed to have drowned after being washed away by the floods. Isabel Nakiria, reporting for DD India in Kampala. Thousands of Israelis rallied in Tel Aviv on Saturday calling for the immediate release of hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. With placards and banners and a stage with people caged in them, resembling those held in captivity, the crowds chanted, bring them home now and pledged to start protesting on the streets and calling for a mass march. True talks between Israel and Hamas will resume on Sunday in Cairo. This is the latest attempt to bring about a pause after nearly six months of conflict in the Gaza Strip. On Saturday, Egyptian Foreign Affairs Minister Sameh Shokri met in Cairo with his counterparts from France and Jordan. With the situation in Gaza at the forefront of talks, Jordanian Foreign Minister Ayman Safadi urged Israel to open land crossings for aid to enter. We can deal with the famine that Gaza's people are facing in a very short time. What is needed is that Israel opens the land crossing from aid to enter from Egypt and from Jordan and to stop denying entry of aid. When renowned international organizations say more than one million Palestinians are facing famine, all that Gaza's population are suffering the highest level of hunger and food shortage, then we are facing a real catastrophe. <laughs> Israel launched fresh strikes on alleged Hamas infrastructure in Gaza on Saturday. Even a U.S. has reported to have authorized delivery of more bombs and warplanes for Israel. Meanwhile, an airstrike in Lebanon wounded three U.N. observers and one translator. The United Nations has also confirmed that several U.N. observers were injured while on patrol in southern Lebanon. The exact details of the strike are still being established and Israel denies any involvement. Alex Kadir reports from Tel Aviv. Well, three United Nations observers have been injured in southern Lebanon as well as their Lebanese translator. There were initial reports that this was an Israeli strike uh, targeting the car in which they were traveling. But the United Nations has since clarified that a shell exploded near these four people while they were on a foot patrol outside of town in southern Lebanon. And we know that uh, uh, the Israeli armed forces have denied any involvement in this uh, particular strike. They were carrying out uh, their observing roles as the peacekeeping force of the United Nations on the Israeli-Lebanon border known as the Blue Line. But it really shows that despite the UN clarifying and Israel denying any involvement, that this is an incredibly dangerous area in which to be operating. We know that uh, Hezbollah has fired rockets into northern Israel just in the last 24 hours. Lots of rocket alerts across the populations living there, most of whom have had to be evacuated, but also Israel striking back against Hezbollah in Lebanon, in Syria, 
and Israel's defense minister saying they will pick up the pace, they will expand their attacks and they will shift from defending against Hezbollah now towards pursuing that group into Lebanon, into Syria, into Beirut, into Damascus if they have to, said Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, and further afield if needed. So certainly a risk of escalation in that conflict. Now in Gaza, the war rages on. We have had Israeli airstrikes there. We've had the Israeli raid on Al Shifa Hospital ongoing with hundreds killed in that particular raid. We uh, also have families being trapped in the rubble after Israeli airstrikes in Khan Yunis and other parts of Gaza. But perhaps a small lifeline of hope. The second ship, aid ship, is sailing from Cyprus now with 400 tons of food on board, flour, rice, vegetables, canned goods, anything the starving population in Gaza may need. It will take more than 60 hours to get there and then we'll have to unload on this makeshift pier uh, built by these charities out of the rubble of the destroyed houses in Gaza. One million meals on their way to the devastated Gaza Strip as this war rages on for another day. Alex Kadia in Tel Aviv reporting for DD India. The Houthi run Sana based Central Bank of Yemen issue new currency coin, the move aimed at replacing the damaged banknotes in Houthi governed areas of North Yemen. This marks the first time they have issued a currency since they captured the capital Sana in late 2014. Yemeni Rial is issued and controlled by the Central Bank of Yemen, CBY, based in the southern city of Aden, the interim capital of the internationally recognized government. The Aden-based CVY, which is recognized by the international community as the legitimate Central Bank of Yemen, warned the Houthis two days ago about issuing any counterfeit currency. And about 90 people, including defense officials, attended a ceremony in Japan's southern prefecture of Okinawa to mark the first local deployment of surface-to-ship missiles on the main island of Okinawa. In a move to bolster its defense capabilities on its remote islands against potential threats. Let's take a look at other stories making news. A sudden fire broke out late night in Scrap Godown in Bilwandi, Taluka of Thane district, resulting in burning of 15 to 20 scrap godowns. The cause of the fire is still not clear, but no loss of life reported so far. Meanwhile, a vehicle of Bhivandi Fire Brigade has reached the spot to control the fire. India's Commerce Minister Piyush Goel distributed awards in Jito Ahimsa Run for Peace in Mumbai. The Ahimsa Run aims to create awareness for a better world to stop wars and hatred and an attempt to bring peace and non-violence in the surroundings. India Meteorological Department has forecast isolated heavy rainfall over northeastern states till Monday with the possibility of a very heavy falls over Arunachal Pradesh, Assam and Meghalaya on Sunday. According to IMD, heat waves and warm night conditions are likely over central and peninsular India for the next five days. The Bihar School Examination Board BSEB have announced the class 10th result today. The BSEB chairman Anand Kishore declared the Bihar Board class 10th results along with the merit list. And still to come on DD News R. Telecom company AT&T says it is investigating a data set released on the dark web about two weeks ago. In Miami Open 2024, Collins takes down Rybakina to win first WTA 1000 title. Cristiano Ronaldo hammers his 64th career hat-trick in an nasser thrashing off Altai in Saudi Pro League. Introducing the DD India app, your gateway to a world of news right at your fingertips. Your most trusted source of news goes global, goes digital. Explore a world of options, top stories, live updates, in-depth analysis and more. Stay informed wherever you are. Real-time alerts keep you ahead of the curve always. The DD India app connecting you to the world one story at a time. Download now and explore the world of knowledge, insights and authentic information. India that invents.
India that innovates. India that excites. India that invites. Land of possibility. Teeming with opportunities. Watch India Ideas each Thursday, 8 p.m. only on TV India. You're watching DD India News R. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. Going back to our top story on election updates, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched the Bhatia Janata Party's election campaign for the parliamentary polls in Meerut in Uttar Pradesh. Prime Minister said that the 2024 elections is not just to form the government, but it is to develop India and to make India the third largest economy in the world. Prime Minister said that when India was the 11th largest economy in the world, the poverty rates of India were soaring. When India became the fifth largest economy, over 250 million people successfully came out of poverty. हम आने वाले पांच साल का रोडमैप बना रहे हैं। नई सरकार बनने के बाद पहले सौ दिनों में हमें कौन-कौन से बड़े फैसले लेने हैं? इस पर तेजी से काम चल रहा है पिछले 10 वर्षों में विकास का जो मोमेंटम बना वो अब और तेजी से आगे बढ़ेगा इन 10 वर्षों में तो आपने विकास का ट्रेलर ही देखा है अभी तो हमें देश को बहुत आगे लेकर जाना है। And telecom company AT&T said on Saturday that it is investigating a data set released on the dark web about two weeks ago. The preliminary analysis shows data leak has impacted approximately 7.6 million current account holders and 65.4 million former account holders. The company said the data set appears to be from 2019 or earlier. AT&T said it does not have evidence of unauthorized access to its systems resulting from the incident. The company said it's not yet known whether the data originated from AT&T or from one of its vendors. AT&T said the incident has not had a material impact on its operations and said the source of data is still being assessed. AT&T in its contact with all those impacted and has reset passcodes for 7.6 million current customers. It also said it will offer credit monitoring wherever applicable. The wireless carrier's 5G network covers around 290 million people across the United States. The world celebrates Easter Day today on Sunday. The festival marks the celebration of Jesus Christ's uh, resurrection and is a symbol of love and compassion. Easter gives the message that truth is eternal and shows us the path of sacrifice and forgiveness. The teachings of Jesus Christ guide on the path of peace and harmony, symbolizing victory over death and sin. Devotees in India's Kerala thronged churches across the state since the wee hours to attend the special prayers and services held to mark the holy occasion. While leading the masses, bishops and priests imparted the message of hope and spiritual revival to them. Fervor of Easter celebrations also witnessed in India's Tamil Nadu, where priests and locals marked the festival by spreading brotherhood and harmony. The President of India, Draupadi Murmu, sent her greetings to all fellow citizens on the occasion of Easter. Taking to social media platform X, President said, and I quote, Easter greetings to all, especially to our Christian brothers and sisters. This occasion of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ promotes the spirit of love, hope and universal fraternity. May the teachings of Jesus Christ lead us on to the path of peace and harmony. 
India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Sunday extended greetings to people on the occasion of Easter and wished for harmony in society. Taking to social media platform X, PM Modi said, and I quote, On Easter, we hope that the message of renewal and optimism reverberates all over. May this day inspire us all to come together and fostering unity and peace. Wishing everyone a joyful Easter. Ceremonies of Easter takes place in India's national capital, New Delhi, to mark the most important festival in the Christian calendar. Devotees offered prayers. A large number of people took part in the churches across the city to mark the occasion. You're watching DD India News Hour. Time now for spot. And India's seasoned player Rohan Bopanna and his Australian partner Matthew Ebden grabbed their second title of the year, winning Miami Open doubles crown on Saturday. The duo beat Croatia's Ivan Dodic and his American partner Austin Krajicek, 6-7, 6-3, 10-6 in the finals. After winning the Indian Wells last year in California, the Indian player had become the oldest man to achieve this feat at 43 years old. And now with this win in Miami, he has surpassed his own record for the oldest man to win the Masters 1000 title. Meanwhile, in women's singles, American Daniel Collins overcame fourth seed Elena Rybakina to win Miami Open Finals. Collins beat Elena Rybakina 7-5-6-3 on Saturday to claim the title on home soil in her farewell season. Collins won nearly 75% of her first serve points while claiming three of her seven break points on the way to victory in just over two hours. The 30-year-old left the crowd, including former Miami champion Andre Agassi, breathless. Collins, who said in January she would retire from tennis at the end of the season, was the surprise winner at the East Coast Tournament. Cristiano Ronaldo scored the 64th hat-trick of his storied career on Saturday as Al Nasser defeated Altai 5-1 in the Saudi Pro League. Ronaldo's Portuguese compatriot, Otavio, opened the scoring for the hosts in the 20th minute. Ronaldo scored a trio of second-half goals to put the three points beyond doubt, bringing his goal tally for the league season to 26. Ronaldo is four points ahead of Al Hilal's Alexander Mitrovic in the race for the Golden Boot. Al Nasser remains second on 59 points, 12 behind runaway leaders Al Hilal, who secured their 30th straight win on Saturday against Al Shabaab. And Hong Kong's Global Art Fair works with a local NGO to highlight art scene to shed light on the community about their special needs. Showcasing the artwork of mysterious lakeside with rainbow sky and dazzling stars at a global stage. That's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I am Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.